Swami himself has, of course, given to them. He would say that class to lena hai, you must take a class, you must teach. So he just loved that. And Swami always prescribed, what is this after completing the study, what is the sadhana, what is to be done, teach. Swadhyaya pravachanabhya na pravaditabhyam Swadhyaya and Pravachana. So this Puja Swami is looked upon as the very best sadhana for all the disciples and for everybody. And so you teach a very dharid one student. Teach. For the very simple reason that of course teacher is the greatest beneficiary of the whole process of teaching. Because teaching is the subtler way of learning. Everybody is teaching uh, in whichever topic, not only Vedanta, anything else that whoever teaches knows. If the intention is to convey, the intention is to make sure that the listeners understand, the intention is that you, it's your privilege to be able to share this with them. And also to help, let them have the same benefit that you had with this teaching. With that this is done. Then teaching itself becomes a great uh, source of learning. When you're teaching, your mind is in a different mode. It should be in that mode all the time. But anyway, when you're teaching, the mind is in a different mode. You are identified with Vedanta, identified with the teacher. Because we start our talks also with invocation for the grace of the Lord and grace of the teachers. And so it is that identification which makes you as though a somewhat different person. You know, a Bada Swami, you know. Uh, so, some trustees, etc., or some questions to ask him. This Swami is different when he's on the stage, you know. So, when on the stage, it's a different Swami. Uh, I guess you are a different person when you are teaching identified with the teaching identified with. And what Swami liked the most or appreciated, because he would like also listen to his own disciples. Not to test them or anything, but just, you know, and then when he found somebody, uh, that the teacher is the one who always keeps the objective in mind and that's how he unfolds. He never loses sight of the objective, never loses sight of the fact that you are Brahman, that what is is Brahman, that sight he never loses. Regardless of whatever he talks, you find the teacher distracting, whatever it is, but ultimately it's always kept in mind. 
And so as we can see with the Bhashyakar also, that is always there. Whatever he talks about, whatever he writes, even when he is supposedly debating with the other opponents and whatever, this vision is always kept in mind, never swerving from that vision. You can see that Shankaracharya never, never takes a liberty with any luxury or any kind of indulgence with anything other than unfolding the vision. No distraction of any kind. Sometimes you have the temptation. When you see some of the verses and description, then you are tempted. And particularly when you are a very learned person, when you are a scholar, when you have the knowledge of many other topics, which many scholars have. They know the grammar, they know the mimamsa, they know sahitya, all these things they know. There is a temptation to bring those things in to make your thing more flowery and colorful. Quite possible that in the process, you yourself may get distracted from what you are talking. Sometimes Mahatma has to ask, Kaan se hai <laughs> Literally, where was I? Because you started with something and you get carried away with something else, which was of course interesting in its own way. But then sometimes it's difficult because we lost track and it's difficult to again. So our Swami always made it a point. I don't know why, but he always made it a point. I don't think I've forgotten. I remember, you know, I'll come back, I'll come back. One other thing, we'll talk about it later. Then later comes or not, God knows. In three days we'll talk about it later. You are talking about what takes one year to talk about in the later. Thing is that we'll come, you know, we will never be out of track. And therefore that vision is always kept in mind. And our Swami used to say also that the teacher should respect the students, is to respect them. As compared to other people who come on the stage and then start, you know, condemning oh, you fellows are all stupid, don't understand anything, this, that, and whatever. That's another style. <laughs> of making them feel inferior and controlling them and then, then different things. But not here. Respect. Don't think that they do not understand or they cannot understand. They will understand if you make it understandable. There is a very famous saying in the Sanskrit. When the shrota or the listener does not understand, there is comparatively ignorance of the speaker rather than that of the listener. So that is the kind of responsibility that has been kept on the show in the bhakta. It is duty to make sure that the listeners understand. Yes, it is possible that he may find the teacher repeating things in different ways with variety of examples and in variety of ways and we find it's not moving further as far as, oh, Swami, how many verses did you do? I don't know. Anyway, the important thing is, of course, now it's, you know, that's a good excuse. Important thing is not how many verses you did, but that you were able to communicate whatever thing. That there was something to take home, something that they feel that they have gotten, something that gives them some insight in their life something that helps them put that into practice, something that helps them to live the life better, that helps them to become better persons. No doubt that Vedanta is of course Tattvamasi, and therefore, really speaking, it must only mean you are Brahman. But then, take into account all the listeners and make sure that how we proceed in that, go towards the goal, what preparations are required, how to put this into practice, only as a point. So this is teaching Puja Swami thought was the best way, most best sadhana. Because the Hittiva Upanishad does say, having talked about many things, then ultimately tapayeva satyam etc. But then svadhyaya pravachana. Eveti nako maut galya. And maut galya said that svadhyaya and pravachana is the very best. That's what Puja Swami emphasized. And therefore, he always wished to create teachers and not preachers or not even missionaries. Even though they're part of a mission and that there is you know some little thing there because but then he did not want to create missionaries. He wanted to create teachers who can 
Because the missionary has a certain goal in terms of bringing some people in the fold and stuff like that is one thing. But a teacher has supposedly a goal only to be able to communicate and make the student say. Meaning that a teacher always has the well-being of the student in mind. A missionary may have an agenda and maybe perhaps some other thing in mind, but the teacher doesn't have that. And therefore he always emphasizes teaching, not preaching. And of course missionary, he also became missionary. <laughs> the thing is that if that is what you've done for other purposes, social service, etc., okay, but otherwise, basically the so the teacher emphasizes always the teaching. And that's how, as our Swami said, you create other teachers. But that was your emphasis. That when <coughs> the students are listening, the, the Brahmacharya is listening, your emphasis is always in how they get it, how they see it. And uh, there was no training program or workshops of creating teachers. There was not that. I mean, just a demonstration, self-demonstration. Meaning the teacher becomes himself, a, uh, he teaches by very example, because he's a whole person. And that is what the importance of Guru Kulam, that you go and live with the teacher. It's good, of course, to read the books and listen to the series and DV and so on and so forth, wonderful. But still, going and living with the teacher has its own thing. Because the teacher teaches is not only clear, it's an embodiment of his very teaching. And that's how you learn from all the various aspects of the teacher. So that's the kind of teacher that our Puja Swamiji was and uh, something very rare, something very rare. And I don't think that these people are created and nobody teaches and they all are come. And that is all brought things with them. No doubt they had their own teachers and they got something, but if you see them, Kya padhaya pata nahi hai, kuch gaye, sam Brahma Sutra hai, Hindi, he doesn't know. He listens to that. So, Swamiji, yeah, you uh, we have to do this thing, you know. And so, I mean, this, what I'm saying is 90% comes, 10% is added. That. That's how these great teachers are not created. They are there and they are, I guess, brought to manifestation. That's what other great people do, is to bring them to manifestation. And so, uh, we, cannot hope to become that. All we can do is to get the most inspiration and uh, see to what extent we can emulate our Guru in whatever best way. Of course, our Mukesh is saying, I mean, the uh, most important thing is what Agya Palan ki jiye, that's all. Guru Agya mein sada rahiye that I do not know in the times of independence and freedom and individual, you know, emphasis on individuality, Guru Agya Marahe means always remain in the command of the teacher. Fortunately, the teacher was not a commanding teacher, that was a good idea, otherwise I don't know how it would have happened. Because Agya means the teacher, do what the teacher says to you. Kept on saying, do this and do that, I don't know how many people, I would not be around perhaps, you know, but anyway, he never said this. He doesn't say. He says that you cannot impart the teaching of freedom, freedom in an atmosphere of bondage. You can't put rules and regulations upon the people and hope them to discover freedom. So no rules and regulations. That is whether right, wrong or indifferent. But that is why it was. Meaning there's no, no structure in that sense that somebody has to do this and not to do that, etc. Which is what a guru is supposed to do, I guess. But Swamiji didn't give much importance to that. So, you know, we expect the, the students to have their maturity, to appreciate the freedom that is given to them, and to grow into that. Because freedom always calls for responsibility. And the one who is mature understands that we have to grow to be able to live up to the trust that somebody has placed on us. So please don't trust. Giving them freedom meaning, placing trust on them. So that is what I mean by respecting them, trusting them, that they have what it takes for them to grow. And then you just create an atmosphere, make it, you know, uh, give them whatever is needed for them to grow. 
But then growth also takes place in an individual way because there are no two persons who are alike. And there was no one prescription will fit everybody. So it's another thing always. Not give them freedom in terms of license, but then still give them. He did not like all very rigid, you know, structure in terms of do's and don'ts. So it's good, Guru Agya Mesada Rahiye. Fortunately, we didn't have that problem. Pro- I shouldn't say problem, but we didn't have that thing that we always had to all abide by the Agya, etc. Because if any Agya that he ever gave was only teach, that's all. That's only Agya that he did. And uh, so it's a very rare thing. Very rare to have a, a Guru of this time who had that maturity, who had the insight into the minds of people, into the minds of the mokshus, and recognizing what it is that they needed, how it is that they needed, and doing exactly that. So, uh, and who has no agenda of his own? The important thing is that if again a teacher has some agenda, that also colors what he does. But no agenda here at all, other than the well-being of the mokshus or in front of him. So it says, you know, there were, as we have said earlier also, say Shankaracharya, that there is no illustration, no compa- no illustration that I can use for comparing my Guru. I looked into all the three worlds, Drishtanda, Neva, Drishtaha, Tribhuvan, In all the three worlds, I look for an illustration or a comparison to illustrate my Guru as to how he is. Sadguru ho Jnanadatuhu, the Sadhguru who imparted this knowledge of Sat or the Self to me, I look for illustration. How is your Guru? Even the poets give all those illustrations, you know, to illustrate. I look for illustration. I could not find it in all the three worlds. Somebody says, what do you mean you cannot find? We will suggest to you. There is a wonderful illustration. But the Guru brings about a transformation in the disciple. I will give you an example of how to bring a who brings about transformation. What is it? Sparsha's chit tatra bhaktavya. Sparsha means a philosopher's stone. You are right. It brings about a great transformation. Idayatinaho svaranata masmasaram. What a wonderful thing that a philosopher, the parasmani does. Svaranata asmasaram. Asmasaram means a little iron. And this philosopher's stone transforms an iron into gold. You mean, isn't that a good example for your teacher? It's a good example, not adequate. Why? Nasparshatam prasapi. A philosopher's stone does not transform another into philosopher's stone. Time of gold, all right, but not philosopher's stone. Then what does your guru do? Sadguru, Sviya Shishya. Sriyam Samyam Vidhatte. On the other hand, the Sadguru, for those who come to his feet, Sriyam Samyam Vidhatte, he gives them Sriyam Samyam similarity. He gives sameness to them, meaning that he makes them equal to them. Never, there is no illustration at all. So he becomes what? Alokika. So his Lokika means something that we can think about. And therefore you become beyond comparison and beyond something that we can illustrate. So that's what Shankaraja is saying about his Guru, that's what we can say about our Guru.